Hey guys, this is Malka Asad, and welcome back to the channel. This is the fourth and the final episode of Dr. Panos' experience matching into neurosurgery. In the first three episodes, we talked about the USMLE step scores, research experience, different pathways to get into neurosurgery. In this episode, we'll focus on the match experience and the different strategies that Dr. Panos used to match into neurosurgery. Dr. Panos, when you applied to the match, you already did two years of research. What are the factors that you took into consideration to know that this is the right time to apply? And what are the different strategies that help you match into the program that you're at now? When it comes to time to apply, um, I think it needs very careful planning. Um, and so I think um, what matters the most is that you discuss about a year ahead. Um, as I said, again, the best plan, the best thing is to stay in one place. And so... Um, discuss with your mentor when you're thinking about applying. Not all mentors are like, you know, are the same. And not all mentors, you know, obviously it's going to depend a lot on the amount of effort that you spend during your research fellowship. And I do think that there is meritocracy in the United States. And that's ultimately what is making all of us, you know, leave our home countries at the comfort of our home countries to come pursue residency in the United States, apart from the training and the autonomy, et cetera. And so if you do a good job, they're going to, you know, they're going to give you back. And I was very lucky to be trained under such an environment during my research fellowship. And so I had a very clear set in mind when I was going to apply. And so a year before I was already discussing, you know, with my mentor, you know, this is kind of what my stats are going to look like, you know, the number of papers, publications, conferences. I try to go to as many conferences as possible, guys, I would say. It's not always easy. It's money. I know registration, et cetera. But try to go to as many conferences as you can, um, just because that's where you're going to present your work and that's where you're going to meet people. And you never know when you're going to uh, need these people when you apply. Um, and so I spoke with my mentor. I personally applied to every single um, neurosurgery program that there is. And I don't think that an international is in the, um, in an, uh, in a position to choose, uh, programs or to apply to a few programs. You never know how many interviews ultimately you're going to get and which programs I'm going to extend you an interview. I do think that you have the highest chances of matching at the program where you did your research in just because if you play your cards well, these people who know you better than anybody else. And so you have very high chances of staying there, but also, um, or you may, you know, match in, you know, to another program. Um, once you um, apply, um, you know, what I did with my mentor is, you know, I had a, you know, a very well-structured kind of nice CV. And, uh, you know, I was waiting for interviews. Uh, I got a few um, you know, you know, without my mentor talking to anybody else, but I would say that half of my interviews I uh, came from my mentor talking to somebody, and not like you know, beg. You know, your mentor is not gonna beg somebody. Nobody's gonna do that. You know, and nobody's gonna start picking up the phone just before they even invite an interview and say, "Hey, please." You know, say, they're gonna. What they're gonna happen is, and that's also something that I encourage people to do is, you know, have a well, you know, prepared CV. And then my mentor started sending, you know, emails or during conferences, he said, you know, hey, Panos is applying, you know, how about, you know, Panos sent you the CV. And if you want to extend an interview, that's great. So essentially a lot of programs, what happened is they have this, you know, the platform that automatically is going to cut people out just because they're internationals. So, or because they had a low, let's say, step one score or for whatever other reason. And so what you want is somebody that otherwise he, your interview will never get, you know, onto his desk that actually is going to say, hmm, let's look into this applicant CV and they may extend you an interview. So I definitely got some interviews uh, that, that way. Um, at the end, um, you know, I started, you know, as I said, I started, you know, in Greece with people telling me that, you know, this is not possible, forget it. I do recommend that depending on the country where you're from, especially, start speaking with people from your own med school or from another med school in your country that are already residents in that specialty in the United States. So by the time I was applying, I knew all the Greek uh, neurosurgery residents. Um, and I met all with all with them, you know, in conferences and I spoke with them on the phone. And that way, by the time I was applying, I also spoke with them and I said, hey, man, I'm applying. This is my CV. Um, would you mind sharing it with the program director? And if he wants to extend an interview, that's great. If not, you know, no harm. 
no you know no grudge or anything but you do need all these connections everything that you were building those two years ultimately is going to be of use to you by the time you apply that's awesome what about the letters of recommendation did you use the combination yeah. of the clinical one and research or you focus on the research since they were more recent yeah yeah that, and that's that's something that kind of um, really you know um, baffled me and um, you know troubled me by the time I was applying um, three of my letters actually were from uh, from Mayo from Mayo Clinic and one letter from was from an outside institution um, for whatever reason I did not ask for letters from the programs that I did my uh, my electives at and um, I was kind of afraid to be honest with you to go back to those programs and ask for a letter of recommendation for something that I did three years back. I do have to say that, it, you know, it can happen and you can tell the program, hey, you know, I'm gonna apply, but I'm not, it's not It's not a bad idea to actually with, with the program director, you know, at the end of your elective and say, hey, I'm applying this year or I'm applying next year. And would you mind if I ask you for a letter, that, you know, at that time? And, you know, most of the time they're gonna say, okay. And most programs actually, they keep a record of, you know, of their, you know, the people that did elective at, you know, their program and, um, they're going to have a track, you know, kind of of how you perform an evaluation of everything. And so they can still do a letter. But just for personal reasons, you know, I applied, as I said, one, you know, letter was from, uh, you know, I did my, my, my uh, one Zabai at Hopkins. And so I kind of had my mentor um, to write, to speak more about my clinical, um, you know, skills uh, in his letter. And then my other letter was from uh, the neurosurgery chair from Mayo Clinic. And uh, I was lucky enough to do a, you know, an elective at Mayo Clinic. So I was able to kind of sneak in kind of, a, you know, a clinical evaluation apart from the research evaluation. But it was actually brought up, I got to say, in a few of my interviews, people said, most of your letters speak about your research skills rather than your clinical skills. So that's something, be prepared. That That's something that the people may speak about. Um, if there is a way in your letters to speak about your clinical you know, skills, that's, that's great. If not, another question that we very commonly um, encounter is, and I also got a few times is, you know, uh, you've been now you know, almost three years out of medical school and you're applying now to a specialty like neurosurgery. How do you think that's gonna affect you in, your, in the OR or your relationship with patients? You have to be prepared. And you know, there is no, this, I don't think this question has any bad intent. It's a very fair question in my mind. Um, and that's why a lot of people will tell you don't do research for too many years after um, med school um, and before residency. Um, uh, kind of the question that I kind of I had in my mind, um, the, the answer that I provided in those circumstances was, you know, you're right. Um, it's been a, quite a few years, but what I can tell you is, and which is something that I did actually, was, you know, go into the you know, cadaver lab and work on some anatomy dissections or trying to go to those um, you know, workshops, perhaps that residents, you know, do and trying to, you know, learn the anatomy better and work on my hands or perhaps, you know, work on a mouse dissection. If let's say you do, you know, basic research. And then I also join my mentor in clinic and see patients together. And I know there might be some visa issues with that, but there is nothing wrong with just shadowing around um, and just showing that you're actively, you know, involved, um, you're, you know, interested in, still honing your clinical skills and not letting, you know, time go by without, um, you know, maintaining that, um, and, uh, maintaining that your touch with uh, the medical school and your clinical skills. So just be prepared to have an answer. And, you know, people were very satisfied with my answer, to be honest. They, you know, so I think as long as you have a good answer to that question, I think you're going to be fine. That's a great point, not only for the answer, but for applicants when they're doing research to focus on these things, to try to stay in touch with the clinical aspect by going to the OR, by uh, even observing or going to shadowing in clinic, uh, doing attending the conferences in, in the residency program you're, you're part of. Uh, this is very something, something very important to consider while, while doing research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So after uh, you, you applied, you get uh, invitations for interviews. How important do you think uh, the interview process is? And is there any aspect that is unique, especially for international medical graduates when they're interviewing? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, ultimately, you know, when you apply um, and when it comes to, you know, you've been through all this journey and all these, you know, series in your life that we talked about, ultimately the, the, 
the main goal is to get the interview. And, and once you get the interview, as you, you know, Malki, uh, now that you're you know, going through this process, I think once you get the interview, you play at a different level, meaning the program has decided that your credentials are good enough that they're going to consider you for, uh, for an interview and for the residency program. And so you have to see yourself now that you're equal. Uh, so any inferiority complexes should go away, okay? And so the programs now on paper that you're good. The question is now is whether you're an actual match, whether you actually fit into the program, right? Um, and so a lot of the, you know, the applicants that you're gonna see are gonna be, especially when you apply for a competitive specialty. And like I saw, you know, during my interviews was, you know, you're gonna have, you know, applicants from you know, Ivy League schools and with great scores and with great stories themselves, right? Um, and so you're like, oh my God, how am I gonna stand out compared to these people? Um, and so I think one of the most critical aspects is, you know, of course, show the programs wanna make sure that you're not gonna be a serial killer and you're not gonna, you know, you're gonna, you're a, you know, a fun person to be around and somebody they can trust and somebody's gonna uh, not be dangerous, of course, and somebody, that's gonna continue build is open to uh, feedback and to um, you know constructive criticism to get better um, and can be reliable and not um, a liar um, and that's gonna be a good resident overall. Uh, like these are the traits, right? A normal person kind of let's say. Um, I do think that as international applicants, uh, we, we if every one of us has a unique story. Um, and that's what you need to sell to the program. Ultimately, at the end of the day, is about selling yourself to the program. And you need to find those traits of your personality, of your journey, of, your, uh, of, your, of the story that's going to sell something unique um, to the program, whatever that is. I cannot give you know, specific advice about that, but you have to show what that is. For example, for me, it was the fact that... Um, you know, before, you know, I, I went, you know, as a medical student, I was, you know, you're trying to be excellent. And then, you, you know, I went to the, you know, to the UK, I did a few actually rotations in the UK. So I also saw Europe and then I came to the United States. So for example, I already could say to them, hey, I've been to some very good programs in, you know, in the UK. And nonetheless, I think that, you know, the, the autonomy, the curriculum, you know, the, um, um, the training in the United States is way better. So they already, you know, they like hearing, you know, kind of hear that, you know, hey, you know, you've been to different places, you've seen, but nonetheless, you know, you, you want to pursue this journey, you want to be here. And then, you know, you have a CV. Um, I was, you know, I was fortunate enough to be productive. I had good letters of recommendation. And then I've kind of showed them, you know, with perseverance and with, um, you know, with kind of the unique research that I did that I was able to sell to them, hey, um, if I come to the program, you want to show also that you're going to use the resources. So always make sure um, that you read about the program that you're going to interview at and see what kind of resources the university has in terms of whether it is, you know, kind of research resources they have, whether it is, you know, degrees that you can have, because you want to show to the program that you come in with a lot of eagerness and, uh, you know, being excited about not only do, you know, very well clinically and take care of their patients, but also of advancing the research and, you know, their academic prestige. And so I was able to sell them, you know, hey, this is what I did during my research and I'm looking forward to leverage, you know, whatever resources the uni that specific program has in order to, to take the whole, you know, the whole program a step further. Um, so you need, you need to find a unique, kind of a unique, um, you know, uh, story to, to sell to the program. That was extremely, extremely insightful and, and detailed uh, advice about the interview and the whole, the whole experience, the whole amazing experience you had. Uh, Dr. Pons, that brings us to the end of our episode yeah. today. Do you have any final thoughts or advice for future applicants uh, to neurosurgery or any other competitive specialty? Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, I wish you all guys good luck. I wish good luck to you, Malka, this year. Um, you. I'm sure you're going to do great. Um, and, um, you know, good luck. I'm, I'm sure you're going to do great wherever you're going to end up with. Um, I do think that for all the um, for all the people out there that want to pursue this, don't let anybody tell you. I had, like all of us, you know, that are, have been through this process, we all have been through some very hard circumstances. And I understand that it's not as easy for everybody as it may sound like. 
Um, we're going to have, you know, obstacles in our way and we're going to have people that are going to tell us that it's not feasible to pursue a competitive residency in the United States. Part of it might be true, but it, nothing is impossible. Um, for example, um, you know, like myself and like many other uh, examples out there, I was able to master neurosurgery at the, at the Mayo Clinic. And so um, I do think it needs persistence um, and it needs, you know, uh, com you know, it needs really passion to do this. You have to maybe a thousand percent sure that you want to do this. Ultimately, it's resources, it's time, it's money. And it's, you know, it needs a lot of courage to go to another country just by yourself and to pursue this. And it needs careful planning. Your time is worth everything you have, right? And so if you don't do a careful planning and you come to the United States just for the sake of pursuing something that is nebulous and you don't have a concrete plan, then this time is going to go um, to waste. So the sooner you decide to do th things in a specific order, like my, you know, in my example, in the order that I, um, you know, I chose, but in specific order, those things that ultimately are going to lead to, you know, applying uh, to residency. So plan well, do your studying well, um, and know what you're going to prepare to encounter when you come here. Thank you so much, Dr. Panos, for this extremely insightful information. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode or future episodes related to the match process, residency, or research in general. If you like the video, hit the like button and share it with your friends and colleagues so they can get an idea of how to match into competitive specialties in the US. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Also, feel free to reach out to my Instagram or Twitter accounts at Malki Asad or my Facebook page, Malki Asad MD. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching and see you in future videos.